Welcome back to Little Wars TV. I am Greg, I am here with Tony, and today we are paying tribute to the Irvin McDowell statue here at Manassas Battlefield in Virginia. The Irvin McDowell? I don't see a statue of Irvin McDowell anywhere here. <laughs> yeah, just a little Civil War humor for you. Of course there's no Irvin McDowell statue here. In fact, there's not a statue of McDowell anywhere in the United States. It is hard to imagine why. Today on Little Wars TV, we are talking about the most forgotten, most despised general in America, the commander of the Federal Army in the first major battle of the Civil War, Irvin McDowell. Greg and I will walk the battlefield and we'll ask the question, just how badly did McDowell blunder at First Manassas? Was he simply a tragic scapegoat or truly the wrong man for the job? After we talk about McDowell and some of his colorful Confederate opponents here, I'll be the referee for a fascinating war game. We'll let four players maneuver on a historical map along the Bull Run Creek with complete fog of war before setting up a stunning 15 millimeter war game based on their map movements. Who will control the creek crossings and win the first battle of the American Civil War? This episode of Little Wars TV is sponsored by our friends at The Great Courses Plus. If you want to learn from renowned professors, they have a video subscription platform with over 11,000 different classes that you can take on a huge variety of subjects. And a lot of those topics are military history. One of those courses is a 48-part series on the American Civil War taught by Professor Gary Gallagher from the University of Virginia. I've read several of his books, but now I get to take his course. And you can join us by clicking on the link in the description below for a 100% free trial. Use our link, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash TV, to check out any of the courses for free or stream them to your phone so you can listen to them in the car. Is that why you wanted to film this in the car? Pretty creative, huh? Let's get back to the battlefield. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. I come up with use it a brain. Hey, we found a statue at this part, but it doesn't look like it's McDowell, though. No, I mean, the Battle of First Manassas did produce some bona fide heroes, and one of them is this statue right behind us, Thomas Jackson. This is where he earned his nickname, Stonewall. You know, there's a reason why he got that nickname. There's a reason why General B famously said, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. It's because the Confederate Army was routing off the field. Mid-afternoon, July 21st, 1861, victory seemed at hand for McDowell. Uh, yes, it did. Uh, he was riding his horse up and down the line, not far from where we're standing right now, just in the valley below, shouting, victory, the day is ours. He was on the verge, right? Uh, yeah, but being on the verge isn't quite the same as sealing the deal. First Manassas, or Bull Run as it would be called in the North, turned into a complete disaster for the Union Army, and it made McDowell a national laughingstock. But it didn't have to end that way. You know, when people talk about this battle, they tend to forget that it nearly ended with the complete opposite outcome. And that leads me to ask, just how bad a general was McDowell if he came so close to winning? To answer that question, let's go back a few months before this battle. The first shots of the Civil War are fired in South Carolina in April of 1861. Within a matter of weeks, both North and South are recruiting vast armies of volunteers for what everyone expects will be a glorious romantic adventure. I think it bears repeating that this battle happens just three months after the outbreak of the war. Before Fort Sumter, the Federal Army was only 15,000 men, and by the time of this engagement, it has swelled tenfold. It is a very rapid mobilization for both sides, and both sides are desperately scrambling to find officers who can command anything bigger than, say, a regiment. Irvin McDowell is handed command of the main Union Army in Washington, D.C., largely due to his personal connections to one of Lincoln's cabinet members. It's often said that McDowell was unsuited for this command, but to be fair, he was a West Point graduate, he was a former tactics instructor at West Point, and he had served in the Mexican-American War. True, but he was a staff officer in that war with no combat experience, basically a pencil pusher. I, I agree, but at a time of rapid military expansion, which you had just mentioned, I'd argue that McDowell was exactly the man that Lincoln needed for this job. He had that logistics background, and with officers in such short supply, 
I don't think that he was a terrible choice in the circumstances. Unlike so many other egomaniacs who would eventually rise to command in North and South, McDowell was a man who knew his own limitations. When pressed to take his nascent, ill-trained army into battle with the Confederate troops massing near Washington, McDowell protested that he was not the man for a battlefield command. He was more comfortable as an organizer of men, and he had only been given a month to train the recruits. The political pressure from Washington was immense. Lincoln famously told McDowell, you are green, it is true, but they are green also. You're all green alike. McDowell led an army of over 30,000 raw recruits, green soldiers, the largest army assembled in North America up to that time, towards Bull Run Creek, a shallow stream defended by maybe 20,000 Confederates, led by General Pierre Gustave Touton Beauregard. You can't say that without a southern accent. It's worth noting that Beauregard was the exact same age as McDowell, also graduated from West Point, and also served in the Mexican-American War. Two key differences though, Greg. Beauregard had direct combat experience in the Mexican War, and unlike McDowell, Beauregard was not lacking in confidence. Despite any perceived lack of confidence, Urban McDowell was planning to attack, and it was a sound plan. He saw the Confederate defensive line stretched too long, and he sought to concentrate against their southern flank, cutting the rebels off from Richmond. It was a fine plan on paper, but McDowell commits only a single division to his probing attack at Blackburn's Ford, and as soon as he meets resistance, he calls off his plan. Yeah, it, it was a tentative start. But to be fair, there were powerful forces that were outside of McDowell's control working against him. First, Southern spies in Washington had infiltrated the government and given McDowell's operational plans to Beauregard. Second, many of the 90-day enlistments for his volunteers were on the verge of expiring, so he had to act fast. Finally, worst of all, he had heard rumors that 18,000 Confederate troops had slipped away from the Shenandoah Valley to join Beauregard at Manassas. That was added incentive for McDowell to attack before it was too late. But it was too late, and that's my point. McDowell was timid in executing his plan, and by the time he gets up the nerve to attack on the 21st, Johnson's troops have already disembarked by rail and are on the battlefield. McDowell's new plan was a mess. He now opted to outflank the rebels on the northern end of their line with diversionary attacks all along the entire creek. Such a complex maneuver was well beyond the means of his poorly trained men. Right now, we're standing near Sudley Springs, where McDowell crossed two divisions to open the battle. McDowell personally supervised the crossing of his two divisions at Sudley Springs. He was leading from the front, not sitting behind a desk. Leading from the front may have cost him the battle here, because in the heat of the moment, he became a micromanager, and in doing so, he failed to issue proper orders to bring up the much-needed reinforcement. In fact, McDowell only ever committed 18,000 of his 30,000 men, and he delayed giving the order to bring up his artillery. That, at the critical moment, gave Johnston and Beauregard a chance to stabilize their lines and from there to launch a counterattack. The Confederate generals only got 18,000 of their own men into the fight, so it's not like McDowell is the only one guilty of tunnel vision. That's true, but it was McDowell's men who were fleeing the battle at the end of the day. Many years after the war, McDowell sat with a British journalist and reflected on the war. Had I won that battle, I should have been the most popular man in America. But he lost the battle, and the fame and glory everlasting went to other officers, such as Stonewall Jackson behind me. I think it's time that we head back to the club and give our players a chance to maybe erase some of McDowell's shame at this battle. Because remember, it could have gone a very different way. We could be standing in front of McDowell's statue right now instead of Jackson's. Not if I have anything to say about it. <laughs> then I take it you'll be assuming a Confederate command. General PGT Beauregard at your service, sir. Oh, General, I do declare, shall we retire to the parlor for a brandy? We shall. If you want to dive deeper into the history of this battle before watching the war game, we encourage you to take advantage of the free trial our viewers can get for The Great Courses Plus. Professor Gallagher has a 30-minute class devoted just to First Manassas, and even if you watch just one video, that's one I'd recommend. He'll give you his take on McDowell's generalship in the summer of 1861. 
For our war game today, I am going to wind the clock back, the day before the battle, July 20th, 1861. I'll let both armies maneuver on this historical map under opposing objectives to secure a foothold on the opposite bank of the creek. Centerville and Manassas Junction are key objectives. As the referee, I'll try to create some fog of war to simulate a little bit of that anxious tension that both sides felt the day of the battle. Uh, hey, where's the battlefield? This looks kind of empty to me. Well, that's a very good question. Now, the table we have right here is empty because we don't know what we're going to set up until both of the armies have done a little bit of pre-battle maneuver on July 20th, the day before First Manassas, on your theater maps. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's get to maneuvering. I'm going to let both teams go separately and do their hidden map maneuvers before the battle. Uh, to play this battle on the tabletop, we are going to be using the classic 1990 rules, Fire and Fury. Check back with us next week for a full rule review video. For today's battle at the First Manassas, I will be uh, running uh, General McDowell. And I'll be playing Brigadier General Tyler. As Tyler, you will be in charge of both uh, Tyler's division and Hunter's division. Yeah, four brigades supported by some artillery and two brigades with a, with a piece of artillery. And I will be in tacit command of the remaining three formations, uh, which includes uh, Runyon's uh, Militia and Reserve, uh, Henselman with three brigades of infantry and two batteries, and uh, Miles with two brigades of infantry and two batteries. Okay, for our strategy here, my hope is, is to sweep in here with Hunter and capture Manassas Junction, hopefully unopposed, and otherwise give stiff resistance and make a try across the uh, McLean Ford there in the middle of the battlefield. Our expectation is, is that the rest Rebels will be in strength in the northern part of the battlefield. Now, if we find that we're incorrect and the rebels are in fact in strength in the south, which we don't believe, then what we will attempt to do is still push with Hunter uh, in the far south, use Tyler to block the crossings, and he will be under a lot of pressure. Yeah, bind them up into an engagement. So that we can then rapidly move from the north and sweep behind either unhinge their position or, more directly, take Manassas Junction. And cut off their line of supply. I'm Tony. I will be playing the t today the part of Pierre Gustave Touton Beauregard. And I'm Josh, and I'll be General Joe Johnson. That tyrant Lincoln has raised an army of 75,000 men and invaded my home state of Virginia. Well, we shall meet him on the field this very day and spill Yankee blood into the Bull Run. And by evening, General Beauregard and myself shall have dinner in Washington. General Johnson has four brigades under his command today of infantry, and those are commanded by General B, General Jackson, General Barrow, and General Smith. And he has two artillery batteries as well in a cavalry, a very small cavalry detachment commanded by General Stewart. Now we are currently holding position at Manassas Junction and are endeavoring to deploy at present. General Beauregard, how about your forces? The rest of our line is held by my command, Bonham, Early, Longstreet, and Yule on our left, the center being Cook, Holmes, Jones, and Evans, and we have five batteries of artillery deployed across our front. Shall we talk about these fine miniatures? Well, this is a funny story, actually, because you were getting rid of these miniatures, and I purchased them from you, so they are my miniatures, but I'll let you describe where you got them from. All of these troops, along with the Union troops, I acquired uh, years ago when we started with the idea of doing some 15 millimeter ACW. They're all flea market purchases. The Confederates are primarily from two lots that I bought at HMGS conventions. The Union troops are acquired from probably four or five different purchases. Um, the troops are a mixture of Essex and minifig and battle honors. And they're painted um, to a variety of standards. But this is a good way, if you're looking to get into a period, to buy some troops without expending a ton of money. All right, the bulk of my forces, my four best brigades, are deployed in the area of Sudley Spring. We are going to force a crossing and make a drive to Centerville, drawing 
the Union forces towards us and allow General Johnson to disembark at Manassas Junction and effect a crossing and capture them in a pincer. My weakest brigades are guarding the crossings here in our center, and once I am across in force and have found the enemy and pinned them in place, I will bring them across to make a flanking attack on said enemy. And we will drive those Yankees all the way back to Washington. They will skedaddle as fast as, as, as we can possibly manage. We'll be dining in the White House this evening. For Tony and Josh to be dining in Washington this evening, they'll first have to punch through 30,000 federal troops deployed along the Bull Run. I allowed both armies full freedom of deployment on their respective sides of the creek, and as you heard in their pre-battle war councils, each side is planning to outflank the other on opposite ends of the line. I had anticipated using a single 6x4 foot table to wargame the results of this maneuvering, but if I want to allow their full plans to play out, I'm going to need to expand this game to two tabletops. Off-table units for both sides will be allowed to enter the battlefield by road marching to the sound of the guns. And the guns are sounding bright and early July 21st, 1861, along the banks of the Bull Run. The Confederates win the initiative roll, and Tony immediately shakes out his brigades to attack from Sudley Springs. Chow, with Miles' division, has less than half as many men to hold the line. How long will they last? Down at the McLean farm on the opposite end of the field, Johnston finds the roles reversed. He has only Stewart's cavalry and Bee's infantry to defend the Bull Run crossings against General Tyler's 5,000 Yankees. It's shaping up as a race for each army to cave in their opponent's flank, and Zack is determined not to lose any time. He immediately assaults Blackburn's and Mitchell's Ford. At the first crossing, Jeb Stewart manages to delay the Yankee advance. But at Mitchell's Ford, Zack is bringing far more firepower to bear. Sorry. Okay, so I have 12 stands? Yep. Okay, and I have eight modifiers. Uh, that leaves me at a sword. plus three. Okay, did, and I lost a stand, right? Yes. Yeah, I did. So Minus one. So I'm at, I'm at plus one. Ten. Three. Um, Ten total. Skedaddle, boy, skedaddle! Yeah, only one stand? One, wait, one <laughs> leader if present, and a stand of troops are captured, so take another stand off for that. It's a bloody repulse for Zack's assault. And worse yet, Josh is now bringing up some reinforcements sent to him by Tony in the center, as well as disembarking another fresh brigade from the trains at Manassas Junction. And it's not just any brigade. Here comes Thomas Jackson. All of this leaves Josh in high humor. All right, we have about two turns into this. About, what, what is that, one hour? About an hour of fighting, sir. And we have lost 800 men to uh, 2,000 Yankees. So, so far, we are doing well. Our bulls are fighting very hard along the bull run and spilling plenty of Yankee blood. Josh may be spilling plenty of Yankee blood above the McLean farm, but Tony has had no such luck. His powerful flanking force in the north is plagued by poor command rolls and effective harassing fire by Chow's Federals. Spoiling for a fight, Tony opts to probe the center. Because we used a hidden deployment, Tony thinks that the stone bridge is vulnerable, but he doesn't realize that he's walking into an entire federal division. Chow reveals one brigade, then another, then a third. The fighting is intense. The rebels take the stone bridge for a moment, but are quickly driven back under Irvin McDowell's personal supervision. And federal fortunes are about to shine even brighter as Hunter's division appears from the direction of Union Mills. Josh failed to scout this ford during our crucial pre-battle map phase, and now Zack's plan to unhinge the Confederate line is coming to fruition. Josh can only look on with mounting concern at this new threat. The trumpet sounded and uh... You know, here comes Hunter marching in, uh, right, heading right from Manassas Junction. And given the Confederate general's reaction, I don't think he has much down in that field, except for maybe an ambush lying in wait. We'll find out. <laughs> so it's not working perfectly yet, but essentially we're following our plan. We're trying to hold in the center in the north mm -hmm. and eventually force the uh, far left hook to take Manassas Junction. I'm going to be swinging as hard as I can this next turn, uh, heading south and heading for the junction. 
Now, what did we do with that scouting report of Union Mills? I, I can't recall, but uh, I, I must have lost it because uh, we have Yankees coming up our flank from Union Mills. Here in the center at the Stone Bridge and at Balls Ford, we are heavily engaged with a large number of Yankees mm. in a violent and, at this point, ineffective struggle to gain a crossing. We have crossed at Balls Ford, but we have not the troops to support it in the face of the large yes, number of yes. Yankees. I believe that right now our effort is uh, too divided across too broad a front, and we must concentrate somewhere so as to break through the Yankees and drive them from the field. By mid-morning, Tony makes good on his promise to seek a concentration, with Beauregard personally urging four brigades to drive Chow back toward Seneville in the north. After an hour of heavy fighting, the Federal infantry have had enough. Mm -hmm. Seven to one. Oh, after you get three to one, it doesn't really matter. This sounds good. Um, battery, if present, part, partially captured. So mark the stand as damaged. And then how far do these guys go? Uh, beyond musket range, so eight inches. So they're also... Oh, so yep. And lose a stand. Yep. Yep. Enemy oh, that is exactly what I was hoping would not goddamn happen. That's not good. We are totally carrying this here position, so... Well, that's not good at all. Though his flank is crumbling, Chow refuses to divert McDowell's attention. He instead forces the issue in the center, where the Federals have their own numerical advantage. Heinzelman's division crosses the stone bridge to press the perilously thin Confederate center. So plus two versus plus two. I got a six total. I got a nine total. Three. Uh, let's see, hard to press, depending brigades disordered to retreat two inches. Oh, man. Take it. Take it, Jethro! Nice! Take it! Battery is silenced and must retreat beyond musket range. Okay. So I'm just going back two inches. That's right, I'll take those two inches back. While the Federal commanders celebrate their success in the center, Zack's flanking force from Union Mills is driving from Manassas Junction. It's Hunter's entire division versus the only reserve Josh can spare, Jackson's brigade. And guess who wins that one? Jackson. With Stonewall earning his name again, Josh brings up a slow but steady trickle of reinforcements from the rail junction. Within a couple of hours, Jackson is the one on the offensive, and the Federal flanking force is retreating so fast, their commanding officer is captured. I got me a <laughs> Union general. That's how you just... Sir, a lemon fucking maniac. The rebels have plenty to celebrate on both extreme flanks. But diverting so many troops to those unconnected fronts has left the Confederate center paper thin. And Zack is throwing every man left in Tyler's division to smash across the bull run. Oh yeah, that river's mine that now. That's the difference of five, right? Yeah. Swept I'm from the one. field. You also have the cover seat. Four to mine! One versus your minus one, I think. For each die result different. <laughs> over I, Woo! Oh, so, so you're, you're getting hurt. another one. Uh, bad things are happening right here. Very, very bad things. I sure as sh will break through. All the way back here. <laughs> Sensing the battle has reached its tipping point, Chow orders General Heinzelman into the thick of the action in the center, hoping to shatter the remnants of rebel resistance on the far side of the stone bridge. In these final desperate moments, Heinzelman takes a bullet, but will it be fatal? Heinzelman. Okay, for the fate of Heinzelman on the road west. You can do it. Six plus, six plus to save him. Six! Oh, Mere flesh man. wounds! I take it! I spit at you! Right, fight another, another round of combat. Okay. I have a total of one. Nine. Difference oh. of eight. <laughs> By early afternoon, the more centrally concentrated Federal Army has splintered the rebels into two isolated wings. And as the referee, at this point, I decide to call the battle. All right, gentlemen, we have made it into the early afternoon, and at this point, the battle has moved beyond our two tables. Uh, the Confederates are pushing on to contest the Union Supply Depot at Centerville. Uh, and the Union have broken through and are going to be pushing on to Manassas Junction. And in terms of casualties, it's about 6,000 Confederate losses to 5,000 Union. But when we tally up all the victory points, 6 points to 12 points, which I think is a pretty comfortable 
tactical Union victory, and it looks like General McDowell has redeemed himself in our battle today. So well done, sir. Uh, thank you. Good thank game you. to all of you. The war will not be over in an afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess we shall be in Washington tonight, but not in vic victory. But. <laughs> From my end of the battlefield, uh, the Union coming in at Union Mills on the far right of our flank really slowed us down. I, I could not push forward because I had to deal with them in my flank. The Union players were very aggressive, uh, much more much more so than the historical Union. Yes, and they were spread out through the entire battlefield, so they had they contested every single crossing. Wow, we had a good concentration here. Uh, the slowness with which it developed yeah. prevented us from taking, that was our hope, that yeah. concentrating here would allow us to flank them and it just didn't pan out. Wow, yeah that was close, that was really, really, really close. <laughs> um, we did well though. Yeah, we broke through the center, but they were crushing our flanks back. I'm telling you, that, that mass, that mass of might underneath Beauregard at Sudley Springs, I, I am so thankful that I was able to delay those units long enough for us to start gaining traction in other areas, because he was smashing me at the oh, end yeah. of the game. Yeah, I thought we were supposed to outnumber them here. I thought so too. I don't think we did. I don't mm. think we did. But okay. you know what? Our plan worked. You know, uh, my hat's off to those guys again. They fought really hard, but uh, so did we. And to the victors, I guess go, you know, <laughs> scotch.